Okay, so welcome students of Roman civilization and ancient history. So today we're going to be looking at kind of how the ancient Greek world affected and helped to develop the history or the kind of the history, the civilization of Rome and and really how um, how these two societies were part of a common culture, a kind of part of this common Hellenistic culture and just sort of some of the developments that Greece brought uh, that, uh, that we need to know, that we have to, to keep in our minds as we began to study the Roman world because uh, for, uh, if we think back on our own time, uh, you know, what Britain was to the United States, kind of Greece was to Rome, that we have this very common lineage that, that goes back uh, on into the, uh, to the ancient past and, and Rome is, is of course no different with, with Greece. So just want you to kind of take a look for a moment here, some of these, these time periods of ancient Greece. So we're, we're both occurring at the same time as, uh, as, the Roman, uh, as, as Roman development is, but Greece is playing a more pronounced role much earlier um, in, in time. And again, any class of mine, don't dwell on dates. We want big things here. So. Greece comes out of a kind of dark age, if you will, of where tyrants rule over its, uh, its lands. And out of this time comes to develop um, this most beautiful thing, democracy, that will be so important in the time of the Roman Empire. And in the, this period from 1200 to 800 is kind of, kind of a time of, of cultural stasis, if you will. Uh, a time where things are not changing, things are remaining very, uh, very plain, and they're not, uh, they're not transforming, they're not, uh, they're not uh, continuing, they're not making things that are innovative. Things are remaining uh, very static, they're not changing a lot. But after this time and around the 8th century, we began to see expansion. We began to see uh, Greek colonization. We began to see the writing of epic poetry. And this is what we really need to, to uh, get excited about um, in the ancient world, is this writing of poetry. Because this and the legacy of classical mythology is the thing that uh, Greece will give in great abundance uh, uh, to the Roman world. And that's what we're really going to look at today. I want you to, to be part of this common lineage of the Iliad and of the Odyssey. Uh, and this, this writing of, of myth. So Greece, as well as the Phoenicians, keep this always in your mind because there will come a time when uh, we meet Carthage and, and those most powerful people in, in Carthage. And they're going to be part of the Phoenician legacy of colonization. And the people of Rome are probably going to be uh, uh, most indebted to the Greek colonization. So you can, you can see up here in the north portion of the Mediterranean basin, you can see here that this is the colonies of Greece, that these, uh, these people come out of the Greek homelands and the Greek isles uh, and they immigrate and they build uh, trading colonies. They set up centers, uh, new places, uh, new places for new people. Um, in order that they, they, can, uh, they can expand kind of their Greek empire, their Greek legacy. They can expand their Greek economy. And uh, all of this, of course, is occurring before the time of Rome. And we began to see writing appearing at this time. So, uh, you know, how we do language, our common legacy of language here is important to, to think about. The Phoenicians are the first inventors of the alphabet, but Greece invents our kind of our modern conception of, of an alphabet. That before this we have pictographic writing, writing that is done in little symbols rather than uh, you know you might have one symbol that means table or house. And in Greek alphabetic writing, Phoenician alphabetic writing, we can communicate much more uh, powerful ideas, more complex ideas, uh, through sound. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, alphabetic gamma, these kinds of linguistic things 
through little symbols that we can put together and communicate very profound things like love. How can you communicate that in, in a symbol, right? All the deep uh, and profound meanings of, of such a word. So we began to see writing develop based upon uh, the, uh, the Greek alphabet that will then become the Latin alphabet that will color our, uh, our understanding of, of Rome and all the records that are preserved in, in Latin throughout the Middle Ages that all come out of Greek alphabetic writing. So three important things that come out of around the year 1200 is this great and common, common legacy of Greece and of Rome and it is of the epic poetry of Homer. That there was believed in the ancient world that there was this great struggle, struggle between Greece and the city of Troy, the kingdom of Troy. Ilium, as the Greeks would, would, uh, would call it. Okay, so back to Iliad and Odyssey. So, this great struggle between the Trojan kingdom and the Greek city-states all begins around the year 1200. And there is the great poem that is written by Homer called the Iliad. Ilium is what the city of Troy was to be called, or was called. And it all begins over a struggle, a struggle over a woman, a struggle over authority, a struggle over power. And I cannot stress to you, I cannot lay enough stress upon how important the work of the Iliad was to the ancient world in both Greece and in Rome, but especially uh, to Greece, that uh, it, until the last couple decades, I would say that there is no text in, in the United States other than the Bible that might have had a, a, a similar effect that, that is a part of a common cultural heritage, something that everyone uh, would knew and participated in and valued and, and took virtue from. Um, but this is the, the one text that shapes everything, all virtue. Um, all uh, beliefs in, in what it meant to be to be Greek. If you were to ask a Greek to say, point me to something to say, uh, you know, what is what does it mean to be uh, to be Greek? What does it mean to be part of this common cultural heritage? They would have pointed you to the Iliad. And within the Iliad, it communicates some very profound lessons. And historians and classical scholars have asked the question. Uh, they don't believe that it is possible that this work could have just been uh, the work of one human being, um, but it was a work of lots of, of people who contributed to a, a Homeric poetic tradition over time. Um, I, I don't believe this. I, I, think that, uh, I think that this is the work of, of one great pen. I think that any, uh, we as human beings are perfectly capable of changing our styles and of writing things differently. And, producing great works, as we can see in, in the hands of Dante Alighieri, or even J.R. Tolkien, I might argue, in our own common context. But Homer uh, wrote the Iliad, which is certainly number one in uh, most important text in, in the ancient world. And it tells of this story, this struggle uh, between the Greeks and, and uh, the Trojans. And he also wrote the Odyssey, which is the, the return of that of Odysseus and, and his men uh, for after the War of Troy. And the great poet uh, Virgil, who I've asked you to look at next class period, um, it wrote the Aeneid, which is also a follow-up on uh, from from the uh, the Iliad. That this is the story of Aeneas, pious Aeneas, who is coming uh, from the, the the last prince of, of Troy, who is immigrating under his great sense of duty to come to the New World. So they're all making taking part in this common heritage uh, from the Greek world, uh, the work of one uh, a poetic genius in Homer. The Iliad itself, the Iliad itself is uh, one great work, and it tells you the story of two things. It tells you the story of wisdom. What does it mean to be wise in the ancient and classical sense? And it asks you, what is the meaning of life? 
these are two things that this work is going to to ask of you as the reader that when you sit down to, to read it and if you never have read the Iliad this is worth your time the the great Prime Minister of, of uh, Great Britain uh, William Gladstone he once uh, he made an argument as a as an undergraduate that all learning at Oxford and Cambridge should be uh, should only be prefaced or should should only be that you should study the Iliad that you could learn all the lessons of life simply from reading the Iliad and interpreting so it's going to ask you, or the, the Homer is asking you this, what is wisdom in the Iliad? What is the meaning of life? So I'm going to, I'm going to take some time here and, and we're going to talk about this story because I think it's so important in, to, to understanding classical history, to understanding classical myth. And the, the narrative of the Iliad begins with the story of the goddess Discord, that there's a great heavenly party that Zeus or Jupiter, the Roman rendering of Zeus, that Zeus has, has had a big party up on Olympus. This is the home of all the, the Greek and Roman gods as up on top of Mount Olympus. And at this party, this, this great party that they're having, they forgot one person. They forgot Discord, the goddess Discord. And so Discord, like the good wedding crasher that she was, decided to go ahead and just show up to the party. She's mad. She has a little Discord about not being invited to the party, being overlooked. Cast aside. Exactly, right? Yeah, so she's she's unhappy. And so she takes a she takes a golden apple and she rolls it across the floor. And when she rolls this golden apple across the floor, three goddesses see this and they, they all want it. They all want it, and that is Hera, the queen of the gods, Venus, or Aphrodite, the goddess of love and Athena, the goddess of wisdom. All want it. And they're all fighting, quarreling over it. And they go to Zeus and they say, Zeus, husband, father, which one of us is the most beautiful? Because that is what Discord <laughs> asked us. She said that the, this, whoever gets this apple is the most beautiful. That is what's written on this. Which which one of us is the most beautiful? So like any good CEO, like any good uh, politician, Zeus, seeing a no-win situation on his hands, demurs. He says, I'm going to pass this down to somebody else to make this call on. So he passes this, he casts this apple uh, from, from Olympus, and it winds up in the hands of this this, uh, this poor, poor man, this poor man, Paris. And Paris is, is tasked at this point with deciding which one of these three goddesses is the most beautiful. And they all promise him various things. Hera promises him unlimited power. He could be the most powerful man in the world if you, if you, choose, uh, if you choose me. Athena offers that you will be the greatest warrior. You will be the strongest and greatest man in the world if you choose me. And Aphrodite, or Venus, she says, if you choose me, I will give you the most beautiful woman in the whole world. You can have her as your, as your wife, your conquest. I will give her to you. And Paris, being a typical young man of... 17 to 20 years old. He says, okay, I'll take the girl. I'll take the girl. Venus, you, you are the most beautiful. Now, if one ponders on what wisdom is there in this state, and this might be a little misogynistic, but we have to think on, on their own terms. If you were the most powerful man in the world, if you'd taken Hera's offer, could you not have 
If you could have ruled the world, you were emperor of all the world, could you not have any of the maidens in the land, the fairest of them all, if you wanted, as many as you wanted? If you were the greatest warrior in the world, the greatest athlete, the most powerful man in the world, could you not have the same? But no, Paris instead chooses. He says, I will, will, have, I will have the woman. That is what I want. I want to satisfy my passions. What wisdom is there in that? Homer might uh, be asking of us. And actually the woman that he chooses, or the, the, the most beautiful woman in the world. See, this is, this is part of the deal. You need to read your contracts before you sign them. The most beautiful woman in the world is Helen of Sparta, the wife of King Menelaus of Sparta. And that's a problem because, of course, Paris, the prince of Troy, has won the deal. And the goddess Aphrodite is going to give him his due. So whether uh, she is stolen, whether she, uh, she goes on her own accord, Helen winds up with Paris in Troy. And this, of course, makes Menelaus, her husband, tremendously angry. As, as husbands often get when their wives are stolen. Menelaus goes to his brother, the most powerful man in the Greek world, the great king Agamemnon, king of Mycenae. And he says, brother, avenge me. Avenge me for the treachery that has been done unto me. And Agamemnon, who was a the greatest uh, of all the Greek kings, and he wants to be ruler over the entire world. And he says, okay, okay, Menelaus, we are going to rally all the armies of Greece, and we are going to go to Troy, and we're going to teach those Trojans a lesson, and we're going to bring back Helen to Sparta, because she was seized. She didn't go by her own will. She wanted nothing to do with that, right? It was all just, it was all just Paris who, who seized her. So the Greeks decide that they are going to go and have, have victory. They are going to go and fight the Trojans. So in order to do this, you have to have a large fleet. So they, they call up a thousand ships, and they call all the great captains of Greece, and everyone shows up. And I remember, uh, if you've never read the Iliad, if you never have taken the time to read this, there is one section of this story which shows it is both the most mind-numbing and boring part of the story, um, but it also shows how important that this was uh, to this culture. And I remember getting in my car and starting at St. Joseph. I was uh, north of St. Joseph, Missouri, and I drove on nearly all the way uh, to my home. It was three hours away, and it, it, I was listening to the Iliad on audio recording. And it, all it does is list the captains, the regions, and, and the principal fighters of every region in all of Greece who showed up to fight in the Trojan War. That's how important it was to this culture that they showed up to fight for this great war. This was uh, you know, like participating in World War II. If you hadn't been there, if you weren't there, um, you lost enormous honor in the ancient world. So all the people of Greece, all the great captains of Greece show up. And they are there and waiting. They are getting ready to board their, their naval armada, and they are going to sail for Ilium. And they began offering sacrifices. And they get right down to the end. And Agamemnon has forgot one deity, forgot one deity to offer a sacrifice to. Forgot to offer a sacrifice. And therefore, this goddess decides to not let the wind blow. And there's a deal that is made between the gods and Agamemnon. And they say, you must offer a sacrifice, but this sacrifice has to be your little girl, your youngest daughter, Iphigenia. And you can, if you do this, you can continue to be the captain, the great man, and conquer Troy. But if you don't, you can remain here in Greece, and your fleet can go under the command of your brother or whoever you choose, but you cannot lead it without the sacrifice. The wind will never, ever blow to move your fleet unless you sacrifice your daughter Iphigenia. What is wisdom? What is truth? What is the meaning of life here? Homer is asking us. 
What do you value most in your life? Is it power? Is it love of family? What is Homer asking you to think about here? So Agamemnon calls up, calls up his daughter, calls her down to the beach, and she, he even promises her this. He says, sweetheart, you're going to marry Achilles. Achilles, the greatest captain of Greece, the, you know, the, the Patrick Mahomes of, of, uh, of, the, of the Greek warriors. It says, come, on, come down to the beach, and you are going to get to wed Achilles before we launch our ships. And she does. And then Agamemnon draws out his dagger, and he murders his own daughter right there on the beaches. And so ends uh, the first book, and the winds, they begin to blow Speaking of Achilles, Achilles, of course, is the son of Thetis, uh, the, the kind of demigod, goddess figure. And he's most famous, of course, for his, uh, his Achilles heel because uh, she had made a deal with Zeus that he could never die as long as if he dipped him in a, a sacred pool. So she picks him up when he was a little baby, and she's only holding him by his Achilles heel, and she dips him down uh, into the water and pulls him back, withdraws him, and so that he's only vulnerable. He can only be pierced by a, a weapon uh, right there on his Achilles heel. So that's where the, the term Achilles heel comes from. But Achilles is uh, hes the greatest warrior of Greece, and his mom, like any good mom, does not want her kid to play football. She doesn't want her kid to be involved in violent sports. Um, she does not want him to go and fight and die on the fields of Troy. And so she disguises him as kind of these, one of these, uh, these, these priestesses that are on a, a particular island. And they need Achilles, though. So Agamemnon sends Odysseus out to find Achilles. And, and, and uh, Odysseus, being a really clever fellow that he is, he, he, brings, uh, he brings out this stuff. He poses as a traitor. And he comes out and he, he lays out all these necklaces and he lays out all this jewelry and, and you know, uh, copies of Grey's Anatomy and all these, all these kinds of shows and things. He lays them out on a table um, before, the, before uh, these, these, uh, these ladies. And Achilles, of course, is dressed up as a woman here in disguise. And then, then Odysseus takes his sword and he lays a sword out on another table near that. And, uh, and Achilles, he can't stand it. You know, he's, he's bored by all this other stuff. He doesn't like Grey's Anatomy. And so he comes over and he begins looking at this sword and he, he sees it. And Odysseus knew right then he had his man. And uh, so he, he then says, who wants to go and fight for, for Agamemnon and Troy? And Achilles, you know, he tears off his, uh, his disguise and he jumps up on the table and grabs the sword. And he says, I'm ready to go and fight. I'm ready to go and fight, Odysseus. And uh, so anyway, he finds finds Achilles, and he takes Achilles uh, back, and they begin to, to sail. So we then have some other people that are involved in, in this tale. You have Achilles, who is uh, you know, the great hothead, uh, the warrior, uh, but the greatest of the Greek warriors. And then you have his contrasting figure among the Trojans, and that is the great Hector. Hector of Troy breaker of horses. And Hector is kind of the, the model of virtue in the story. Hector is the greatest man. He might, uh, he's the second greatest warrior, but he's probably the greatest man um, in, in the story. He is devoted to his family. He is devoted to uh, virtuous and good rule of the people of Troy. He is his, his father's, King Priam of Troy's right-hand man. He is uh, the, the model husband. He is the model father. He is a great general. He is a good, honest, and virtuous man in almost every case. Um, and this is who is going to come into conflict with Achilles. But Achilles uh, uh, has his own quarrels with Agamemnon, and he has his own quarrels with, uh, with Hector. And Hector, being the great general that he is, stops the Greeks. Time time and time again, the Greeks are failing because of the genius of, of, uh, of mighty Hector. And so they call up Achilles and his, his men, the, the Myrmidon, and they, they have some success on the field. And, and Achilles actually finds a, a woman there. He 
finds a woman that he, he, uh, he kind of falls in love with, a servant of, of these people, a slave. And, um, but he, he loves her. He, he's, he doesn't possess her just because, uh, you know, he, he wishes to have, you know, uh, carnal relations with her. He loves her. He loves who she is. Um, and Agamemnon, as the leader of the conquest, has the right to take anything he wants. He has the right of first spoils. And so he takes this woman for himself uh, against Achilles' will. And therefore Achilles says, I will no longer fight for you. I will no longer uh, participate in this struggle. I will no longer help you, Agamemnon. And sure enough, the Greeks began to lose really, really bad without their best player. You know, without Patrick Mahomes, the Kansas City Chiefs are not a very good team. Without Achilles, the Greeks are not a very good army. And he sits in his tent day after day watching the Greeks be massacred and defeated on the field at the, at the head uh, uh, led by Hector and the, the mighty Trojans. And finally Agamemnon has to relent. And he goes to Achilles and he says, look, I may have messed up a little bit. And I tell you what, because of my honor, I have, to keep this, I have to keep this woman that you want. I will not give her back to you. But I will give you, I will give you seven times seven. So Achilles makes a deal. Or, he, or uh, Agamemnon is going to make a deal with, with Achilles. He says, I will give you ten times, or I will give you seven times what your, your uh, reward is for this of a, of a captain. I will give you that in gold, in, in choice female slaves, whatever you want, I will give you. And Achilles says, no. He says, you are a dishonorable, nasty, awful person. I will never fight for you because you wrecked my honor. You took from me what was mine, and there is nothing. You could give me ten times of the, all of the spoils of the war of this entire conquest, all the gold, a thousand, ten thousand of the choicest female slaves. I will not accept anything from you. Nothing, no amount of wealth, nothing will repair the damage you did to my honor. Homer here is asking us, what is wisdom? Is this wise to, to, to not negotiate, to, to not concede anything ever? Is, well, I mean, uh, this man stole this girl. So. Exactly. What, what is the sin of pride here? What is, uh, you know, what is going on in this? What is the meaning of this? What is the wisdom in this? What is the truth in this? And Homer is going to then tell us that this, this price of honor is high, is very high. Because Achilles goes back to his tent and the Greeks began to lose and lose really, really bad. And his cousin, Patroclus, the one who he loves, his best friend, his dearest, his, his most cherished friend, says, I cannot take this anymore. And he begs Achilles to go out and fight. And Achilles says, no. Agamemnon has dishonored me. I will not fight for that man so long as he is the captain and the king uh, over, over this, this group of warriors. And Patroclus just finally one morning cannot take it anymore. And he takes his, his, uh, his dear friend's armor. He puts on Achilles' armor. Patroclus, a great warrior in his own right, but he is not Achilles. But he looks like Achilles. He moves like Achilles. Even Achilles' own men think that he is Achilles. And he leads uh, the, the captains of Greece out, and they rally. They, the, a cheer goes up among all the Greeks. Achilles has returned to the field. And he, uh, he rides out, to, and uh, he begins to fight. And Hector, seeing this as a, as a principal moment in the battle, he's, he says, Achilles has come out. They are desperate. Something is happening here. So I, Hector... 
the breaker of horses, the great and virtuous captain in the Greeks, I am, or among the Trojans, I am going to go out now, and I am going to finish this man. And he sends the armies of Troy out in the field, and he begins to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Achilles, what he believes to be Achilles. And there's a good fight that goes on, but Hector then slays Patroclus. He slays what the Greeks believe to be Achilles. And this is a, a terrifying, lowest moment um, in the, the great Homeric struggle for the Greeks, I think. And Achilles can't believe it. You know, he just, he goes, uh, he goes insane. He loses a sense of, of who he is, where he is. Um, his grief, sing, O muse, of the wrath of Achilles. But that is what the entire story is about. The wrath, the struggle, the, the terror, the fear, the anger, the hatred of Achilles. Sing, O muse, of the wrath of Achilles. And Achilles is enraged over this act. He, he does not care that he thought, or that Hector thought that he was fighting him. He does not care about any of these things. All he can see is vengeance. So he takes the armor off his beloved friend Patroclus and he puts on the armor. And he rides out in his chariot to the very gates of Greece. And he challenges Hector to one-on-one -on -one combat. He takes off his helmet. He calls him out and he says, Now you can see that I am Achilles, and I have come for you, Hector, breaker of horses. Because I am Achilles, breaker of men. And he rides around the city, and he taunts him. And finally Hector knows that he has to do his duty. That if he stays behind the walls, that is wise. That is wisdom. To see a superior enemy and not to engage that enemy is a wise decision. Starve them out. But Hector, honor, his pride, everyone saying, you are the great Hector. He maybe makes a mistake here. And he has to go out and he has to fight. He knows this. It would be dishonorable of him not to do this. So he goes out and he meets Achilles on the field and they fight. And it is the grandest fight in classical literature. And Hector as Achilles will recount later, says he was the greatest warrior that I have ever fought, and he almost beat me. But he didn't. And Achilles kills Hector there on the fields of Ilium. And he then ties Hector's body to his chariot, and he drags it around the city, and he mocks Hector, and he mocks the Trojans. And he says, see, this is your great captain. This is your great leader. Oh, the mighty Hector. And he takes him back to his, to his own camp, and eventually, eventually, um, overwhelmed with grief, King Priam kind of makes his way disguised as a, as a beggar to the tent of, of Achilles. And he kneels down. And one cannot help but being, be mo moved by emotion. If you are not moved by this scene in the Iliad, you do not have a soul and you do not have emotion. And Priam bends down and he grabs the, the hands of Achilles and he kisses them. He says, I, you do not know who I am, but I kissed the hands of the man who murdered my son. Let me have his body. Let me take his body back and give it the proper funeral rites so that he might cross over the river Styx um, and enter into Elysia, the home of the great warriors, the heaven of the, the, uh, the ancient world. And just for a moment in time, just for a moment in time, Achilles' wrath is stayed because when he looks at old, tired, beaten down, grief-stricken King Priam, when he sees this man, he remembers his own father, his human father, back in, in, uh, in, in Greece. And he thinks on that, he dwells on that, and he says, okay, okay, you can take, you can take the body of your son back and give him the proper funeral rites. And he declares a truce among the armies. He has no authority to do this, but who would go against the word of Achilles? Agamemnon is, of course, enraged by this, but it doesn't matter. And this is how the story of the Iliad ends. It is the story of Hector's funeral. This is 
where Homer stops the tale that they gave all the funeral rites to mighty Hector, breaker of horses. Homer concludes the tale there. <laughs>